Okay. This is lecture three, the third part of control design using root locus techniques. We were talking about lead and lag compensation um, in individual components before. Now we're going to talk about mixing them together. Lead lag compensation. So what if your system doesn't have an additive a transient response and has too much steady state error? Then you have to both fix the transient response and the steady state response. It's possible to combine both lag and lead compensation together. In a cascade, the lead compensator handles a transient response and the lag compensator handles a steady state error. Either one can be designed first, but if we design the lead before the lag, if you remember, the, the lag compensator is much easier to design than the lead compensator because all you really need to know is, is uh, the zero values and the, and the pole values, and then bang, you've got yourself a lag compensator. And if you do it the other way around, then the pole and the zero from the lag compensator have to be included in the design of, or the determination of this angle deficiency for the lead compensator. So let's do the lead first and then the lag. If you evaluate the uncompensated system for its open and closed loop characteristics and look at the root locus and then if the, if the gain adjustment will meet the requirements, you're done. That's no different than before. So if you see that by changing the gain you can fix the, the transient response, then you don't need a lead compensator in the first place. You can just perhaps uh, change the gain and you'll be finished. And then if you have to, to fix the steady state um, response and you can put a lag compensator on there. But supposing that you can't, then we need to have transient response specifications to help us design the lead compensator, simulate the system to check, and then look at the steady state response, uh, steady state response specifications to design our lag compensator that goes on top of that. Simulate the system to check once again. And then you know, that with all of this, with all of this, there is no uh, certain science behind it. Uh, it is all a sort of rule of thumb and how we do these things. And so it is possible that when you get to the end, it's not quite good enough, and so you might have to go back and fix it up a bit. The best way to do this is with an example. So let's try an example as shown above. We have three poles, one at the origin, one at minus 6, one at minus 10, with the gain k defined as shown above with unity feedback. Well, we're looking for a compensator that will give 20% overshoot and a twofold reduction in settling time from 2.19 seconds, and then a tenfold improvement in a steady state error for a ramp input. So 20% overshoot, well, that means uh, the damping coefficient needs to be 0.456, and that's just the uh, percent overshoot uh, conversion over to the damping coefficient. And open loop poles at 0, minus 6, minus 10, um, those will help us uh, figure out what the system looks like with our root locus. So here's a, a root locus plot. Um, one, and the open loop poles are at 0, minus 6, and minus 10. And since we have three finite poles and no finite zeros, we've got a system set up like this according to MATLAB. And with the 20% overshoot, the closed loop poles will lie upon the 62.87 degree line, we're given this uh, damping coefficient. And so wherever it is we need to have our closed loop poles, we know that if we want this 20% overshoot to be true, we need to have those closet poles be on this line. So, in other words, one thing you might say is that, all right, whatever the value of S is going to be as far as the real part and imaginary part, to actually get it to lie along this line, it'll be A, whatever distance that is, so that would be like the resonance frequency or the natural frequency, multiplied against cosine of 117.13 plus J sine of 117.13. And if you put those values in, then that tells us basically how, you know, what the rise over run is going to be for that line. Um, our angle criteria, again, our angle criteria tells us where the root locus is. And um, whenever this is, whenever the angle criteria holds, then we know that we're on a root locus. If it doesn't hold, we're off of a root locus. So let's try some values. Um, when A is equal to 1, our S is equal to minus 0.456 plus uh, j times 0 0.890. If you look at our angle criterion, well, that's minus 131.6. That's a long way away from 180 or 180 minus 360 degrees, which is minus 180 degrees. Any one of these values is all right. Plus 180, minus 180, plus 180, plus 360, 
plus 180 minus 720, and so on and so forth. Here you can see the closest value would be minus 180, but still isn't really even very close. If we go to A is equal to 1.5, then put in that value, then we end up with 139.4, and it's still not quite equal to 180, but minus 180, but we're getting closer. And if we keep going, 3, 164.3 with a minus sign, that's closer. And if we try 4, 178.9, well, that's approximately equal to 180. And I don't know, maybe that's close enough. If we actually do it a little more carefully and keep substituting in new values, we can see that um, 3.9335 um, for our length of our vector, or this is be the natural frequency, then we get minus 180 uh, to at least, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 significant digits. Now, the gain is the products of the lengths from the poles to the desired point that we've ended up finding here. That's the point that we said that we wanted. Um, where it lies on the root locus, because the, ang the angle criterion holds. All right, and so then the given products of the lengths from the poles to the desired point divided by one, because there are no zeros. When you have no zeros, you simply divide by one. So here's one zero, we substitute in for the value of s. This is the zero, uh, or the pole, I should say, the pole at the origin. S minus a zero, there's one. There's S minus a minus six. S minus a minus 10. So that's the one zero a pole, another pole, and a, a third pole. And we end up with 192.1 should be our value of gain to put the closed loop poles at this point. A here, again, is the natural frequency of the system, 3.9335. Hertz. So when we write this, we should probably write in here hertz or you know inverse seconds, whatever. The static velocity error constant for the for the existing system is 3.2, and what we're looking to do is to uh, have lead compensator design. Remember, we want a twofold reduction in the settling time. So if we want a twofold reduction in the settling time, we go back and look at the second order plot. The real part of the complex poles must increase by a factor of two. So when we look at where the, the poles are at now, okay, on our, on our root locus, all right, then what we're saying is, is that the real part here, that's actually, um, that's actually related to one over the settling time, okay, if you remember from second, uh, the third year course. And if we want to have a twofold reduction, meaning a twice and we want to reduce settling time by a factor of two, then we need to increase this by the same amount. If this is, uh, I don't know, alpha, then we need to put another alpha in here. And this is where our poles actually need to be, somewhere out here. And maybe, you know, the angles need to be the same, so we need to actually have them not here at all, but rather out here on the same line, so we get the same damping coefficient. So this is where we need to have our final poles located at. The overshoot remains the same, so the closed loop poles are mined along plus or minus 62.87, and the imaginary part is also doubled to 3.501 uh, times 2 is 7. And this is because, you know, we, we need to maintain this angle. Okay. The new closed loop poles are to be at minus 3.59 plus J7. That's coming from here, uh, from here and here. So those these two values give us this final value for where the pole should be in it should be at. So the poles should be here. Our root locus is here. The poles aren't on the root locus. We know no matter what we change the gain to be, we're not going to get there with just the gain by itself. So when we draw in the new poles, the horizontal line PA and then the line OP we see that this angle here is 117.13 degrees. Remember, we're doing this to try to find where our compensator should be at. And this is for the lead compensator. The idea being is that, all right, if we're going to put the root locus through here, we have to look at the angle criterion. That means that we're going to find our angle deficiency. Once we got our angle deficiency, that'll tell us what angle we need to have to put in here so that the root locus actually goes through this point. So the draw the new poles, as we've shown here, 
And the bisecting line, well, that's that's half of this 117.13 uh, degree angle here. That's 58.57 degrees down from the vertical line. And so that, that positions our PB line, a bisecting line. And so then our APB is 58.57 degrees. Our angle deficiency, well, what is angle deficiency? If we actually substitute in the value of where we want our poles to be located at for a closed-loop system into this in the original plant, we see that the angle is 124.3. The closest to this is positive 180 degrees, so the angle deficiency is 180 minus 124.3 degrees. That's 55.7 degrees. That's our angle deficiency. So we know that now, so let's place the pole in the zero of the compensator, pole in zero of the compensator, point C and D, point C and D here, so that the angle between these two lines, PC and PD, is equal to this angle deficiency, 55.7 degrees. So we use this as the center line and we'll place the two lines uh, PC, PD, about PB, and these each of these angles in here is half of the total phi angle, so it's 27.9 degrees, and so if we do a little bit of algebra here, or a little bit of angular calculations here, we see that the APC angle is APC, that's 30 degrees, a little over that, 30.7 degrees, and then APD, that's 86.5 degrees. So point C is along PC from P, and we're doing the same thing again, where we're finding where C is located, 13.71 um, on the left-hand side of O, and then D, um, D is at 4.02 left of the origin. Okay. So if we do that, we have our, our zero and a pole in here, and this is actually our compensated root locus. Now, remember, what we wanted is we wanted to have the poles here at P. Well, if we change the gain, we can even make the system unstable by putting closed-loop poles over here on the right-hand side. Obviously, that's not what we want to do. We want to put them here so that it goes through that original point. So we want to have this as for the closed loop poles. And notice you have another pole. Whoops. Well, notice you have another pole over here, and you have another pole that pops in. The complex poles actually describe the behavior of your dynamic system, and these ones dominate. You know, and you notice the real poles, the real closed loop pole here, it's actually closer to the origin. Well, we don't have to worry about that too much. That actually describes the uh, the first order effects, and these describe the transient behavior of the system. So. Now again, we can find the gain that will put the closed-loop poles at these specific locations that we want, um, meaning this position. So we'll look for the gain for that value. That's a product of the lengths from the poles to the desired point, divided by the lengths of, um, of uh, the products of the lengths from the zeros to the desired point. So we go through, here's one zero, that's S uh, plus zero, S plus six, S plus 10, S plus 15.37. Notice we put in the compensator and then we have a zero from the compensator, S plus 4.02. So if we do all of that, we end up with 1081. That's supposed to be our gain. So the resulting system has a damping ratio of 0.456. Natural frequency is 7.87. The settling time is down to 1.13 seconds, down from 2.19 seconds. And the overshoot is right at 20%. And static velocity constant? Well, it's up to 4.71 uh, from 3.2. So that means our static velocity error is actually down from what it was before, isn't it? So there's where a close-up of uh, pole locations are. If you compare it to the previous plot, uh, a few slides back, then you can see that they've actually moved, and these are exactly where we want them to be. And so now we've taken care of our transient behavior of our system with this pole and zero, okay? Pole, zero, XO is lead, aux is lag, XO is lead, so XO, and then we've got our lead compensator in there, and that defines the behavior of the system. We fixed the gain so that the closed loop poles are where we want them on that that system, and so then now we go to the lag. Now we need to push down the steady state error, even though the lead compensator reduced it already. We need to do a little better with that. All right, so we need the steady state error constant to be even higher. We need to further increase the static velocity error constant from 4.71 to 10 times the original value in other words, 32. So what we need to do is, after we put that lead compensator on, then it, it went from 3.2 to 4.71, and now we need to take it from 4.71 to 32. That means the ratio is about 6.79 times 
from the lead compensated value to what we're wanting. So we'll use this value as the, the quantity to put in for our lag compensator. So the zero and pole and lag compensator are placed by using the what we want for our new coefficient of uh, static velocity error to the, compared to the old one, and that's where the zero, zero pole ratio comes in. That's supposed to be 6.79, so our ratio is 6.79, and so we say that that whatever the value that is, that's equal to beta in our in our lead uh, lag compensator here, and then we worry about t later to so that the 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 pole is first placed very close to the origin, and then we worry about what the zero is. So beta is equal to 6.79. We place the pole, pole close to the origin. So I say, I don't know, we'll put, put the pole at 0 0.01, and that gives us a t of equal to 4.73. So then it gives us where our zero is at. So th here's where our zero is located. Here's where our pole is located. No, notice how close they are together. That shouldn't uh, uh, fool with the the lead compensator and the, the transient behavior of the system too much. Here's our gain in there. And then, of course, then we have k hat c. That's from our lag compensator that we said we haven't found yet. And so then we look for the closed loop poles along plus or minus 62.87. Remember, this is where we want our closed loop poles to be along that line for the appropriate 20% uh, overshoot. And so then we look here, and here's the, um, when we look for the angle condition, we actually see that at this value for our uh, are along that line, along that line that's sloped along 62.87 degrees, that that's where our our system will have its effect. And so then the gain, using product of distances like before, we see that the 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 gain for the lag compensator is 0.99. Notice how close this is to one. So in an exam you could say, well that looks like one to me. So our final design. When it's corrected for the to correct for the fact that we've put our lag compensator in there to move the poles just slightly, we had 1077 for the gain. There is uh, one of our zeros. There's our other new zero. This is from the lag compensator. This is from the lead compensator. Here, these three poles are from the original system. This is from the the lead compensator, and that's from the lag compensator. So the resulting the resulting system when we put the lead compensator on there is uh, zeta is equal to 0.456. Natural frequency is 7.87. Notice that these didn't change too much, and the settling time is down to 1.02 uh, from 2.19 seconds. Overshoot is still 20%, and static velocity error constant is up to 31.2 uh, from 3.2. So when we put that lag compensator in there, it really worked. So the ramp steady state error then is is 1 over kV 0.032. We really crushed our steady state error for a ramp response. This is our final root locusness. We have a zero and pole very close to the origin here. That's from the lead compensator. And this is the final result of our system. Now, you remember back in the previous lecture when we talked about PI and PD controllers? Well, PI controllers are low-pass filters for those of you that happen to know something about electrical engineering. And PD controllers are high-pass filters, so they pass the high pass, uh, the high part of the signal. And designed correctly, PI controllers improve the steady state error without affecting the transient response. PD controllers improve the transient response without affecting the steady state error. So a, a typical PI controller is of the form K1 times the quantity S plus K2 divided by K1 divided by S. Or, in, in other words, we have a, over here if you look, we have um, an integrator, and then we have a zero that's not at zero. And the interesting thing about this is this is very similar to a lag controller. Notice that, you know, we have ourselves a zero if we actually look at this, the X is right at the origin, and we have an O. Ox means right lag. So we've got ourselves a nice lag controller. A pole is placed at the origin, and zero is an S plus A. So the zero should be placed near the pole at the origin to avoid affecting the closed loop poles. So when we talk about PI, um, what's possible with PI is ox, lag, similar sort of behavior. Um, what you're working on is the steady state behavior. Pi ox lags, s, I don't know, what, what else can I do? The design process is simple. If you just guess a value for ZA and then see what happens. Um, it's a lot simpler than with the lag controller. So, you know, if, uh, if you know how to do the lag controller, you can definitely design a PI controller. It's really simple. 
because after all the the pole is already placed you just move the the zero around and then simulate it to see what happens a pd controller is of the form as shown here you end up with basically just a zero that pops in and with a leading gain um, and typically the behavior is somewhat similar to a lead controller the design of the zero location can be accompli uh, accomplished by calculating the angle deficiency phi in typical look times and the idea is, is that, that you just guess a value for A in here and then simulate the system. And then you're just looking to see does it meet the state state error requirements out of, your, out of the behavior of the system. And that's actually, this should, this should say, sorry about that, that should say transient. All right, transient behavior of the system. And PID controllers, just like lead lag compensation, are a combination of the PD and PI controllers. And you can design for the transient response for the PD compensator. Um, PD compensator zero and then go back and fix fix up the state state error with the PI controller. So here is the idea, improve state state error, take a PI controller, worry about where the zero should be placed. A lag compensator, same idea. So PI is, uh, PI is lag, PD is like lead, okay, so where you place the zero will, will tell you, um, uh, it will give you some help with the transient response, just like with a lead compensator. One of the things that you're, one of the big differences between the PI and PD and the lag and the lead is the following. The PI require active circuits, meaning that you have to provide separate power into the system to actually make this possible to have a zero, um, I mean a pole placed in at the origin or a zero placed in without a pole. You actually have to provide power in. And these can be what's called passive elements and these are, are quite efficient as a consequence, and these uh, PI and PD controllers might not be. And they're typically much more expensive to implement, implement. The PID is basically a, a nice combination of the two. And furthermore, it, it just like the, the original system, I mean the original um, PI, PI and PD controller, you also have to worry about active circuits, meaning you always have to provide power in to actually affect change. Um, a lag lead controller, you have uh, a zero and a, a pole, a zero and a pole, and so you're not changing the order of the system, and what that means is, is you do not need an active circuit. If you're changing the order of the system as you're doing with a PID controller, a PI controller, or a PD controller, then, then you have to have an active circuit. If you don't change the order of the system, uh, you don't have to have an active circuit. So, what were we originally talking about is lag lead compensation of, uh, of that dish uh, to actually get it to do what you wanted it to do. And you try to manipulate the steady state behavior and the transient behavior uh, by putting a compensator in there to fix up its, uh, both of these behaviors. And the way you would do it, you put the lead compensator in first to fix up the transient behavior to be what you want, and then you put the lag compensator in after that to fix up the trans, uh, steady state behavior. And uh, presented, presented horizontally here, is uh, the result, and I, I can appreciate on an iPod or something, it's probably difficult to read, but if you look at the PDF, it, it, it should be quite legible. All right, so this is actually the solution to the problem that's given at the, the initial part of this lecture. Okay. So, compensation can alter the shape of the root locus by the placement of zeros and poles. So, you can put zeros and poles in there as you please, and it'll, it'll fool with the root locus. Um, you put in poles, it makes it more unstable. Put in zeros, it makes it more stable. Lead lag compensators are passive components and require no input power, so they're quite nice to, to try to set up. PI, PD, PID controllers are active components that require separate power supplies and, as a consequence, can be quite expensive to use. Um, the design of uh, PI is similar to a lag compensator. PD is like a lead. PID is like a lead lag together. A combination of um, the lead, lead and lag, or a common, uh, the PID, can provide good control of both state, state, and dynamic responses of a plant. And one of the things that you really have to watch out for, again, is especially when you get your poles and zeros close to the origin for your controllers, that's easy to saturate the signal. And what that means is, is that if, uh, say, for example, you have input into a voltage input into a motor, a nine volt motor. Well, if you get your poles and zeros too close to the origin, then what can happen is, is that the voltages are either zero and not, or nine all of the time. There's no 4.5 or 
the nice smooth change from low values to high values. It always pops directly up to the instantly to the highest value possible, and it causes um, a lot of nonlinear effects can be quite undesirable. And that's what controller saturation means. Is it's just constantly giving you the maximum input into your into your plant. All right. Try the problems in the lecture for yourself. Give those exam practice problems a real try. I mean, those are representative of kind of the things you might see on the exam. And it's a good idea to try them now. And then once you've got that figured out, then you can go on and we can talk about other stuff later in the semester because this stuff builds. Okay. Thanks. And I hope you've enjoyed this lecture.